Welcome to today's seminar, which is a seminar of the Campus Parisien. Welcome uh, to everybody. Uh, it's, uh, it's an honor for me to introduce Abbe Ashtekar, uh, who gives the talk today. Um, Abbe is um, even professor of physics at uh, the Pennsylvania State University. He's a holder of the Eberly Family Chair in Physics. And actually, because we are in Paris, I should mention that he's a former professor at Paris 6 University. He's currently director of the Institute for Gravitational Physics and uh, Geometry. He has been uh, elected a uh, member of the National Academy of Science and uh, has been awarded many prizes, so I will not say them all. It would take the hour, I think. But uh, just the most recent uh, one, which is uh, the Einstein Prize uh, from the American Physical Society. He's uh, very well known in the GR community for having introduced the so-called Ashtekar variables for the Hamiltonian formulation of general relativity. And this paved the way uh, to uh, a new field then uh, of uh, GR, which was a loop quantum gravity. And uh, he was uh, he has been uh, still very active in, in this domain and the subsequent uh, subfields since then, like uh, loop quantum cosmology. And uh, he has been interested in uh, uh, many different aspects of GR, uh, including, for instance, uh, black hole uh, theory of isolated uh, horizons, or, or the theory of uh, gravitational wave radiation, asymptotics of space-time, and, and so on with always a particular focus on the geometrical aspect of physics. So today he will uh, speak about uh, quantum gravity in the sky with a question mark. So let's see what the question mark means. Thank you. So it's a great pleasure to be back here. I mean, I was with uh, the Planck team had me visit here in the uh, 2015 uh, Planck uh, Symposium. And so it's good to be back up here. Um, and I had a very stimulating time yesterday with uh, both gravitational wave group and the cosmology group. Um, so I was told that um, the, by the organizers that uh, the audience is very mixed. So I'll, the, the, my presentation will not assume any technical things about quantum gravity. Uh, and in fact, even though this is kind of the hotbed of CMB, I will also not assume too much about uh, CMB itself. Uh, because there may be people, students particularly that I met just now uh, before the talk who, who were from very different uh, areas. So I'll also explain a little bit about how we uh, extract information from CMB and how quantum gravity uh, adds to that. And it's really the work by many, many people, but in particular, I'm going to focus on some work that was done by, uh, with, uh, in collaboration with Brajesh Gupt. Uh, Dong Wee Jiang and Srinath, which appeared on the archives uh, on, on just this week, I think on Monday or Tuesday, Monday. Okay. Okay. So basically the idea here is the following, that over the last two or three decades, there have been spectacular advances in our understanding of the early universe, both in terms of the nature of space and time and the large scale structure of the universe. And interestingly, these advances have opened an unforeseen window to see some quantum gravity effects in the sky. And this is a fascinating interplay between fundamental aspects of quantum gravity, such as the quantum nature of geometry in loop quantum gravity that I particularly specialize in, and the CMB observations by the Planck collaboration. Throughout this talk, when I refer to the Planck collaboration, I'm using capital letters, because there's also Planck scale, Planck domain, and so on, and that will refer to the, you know, the quantum gravity domain. So if it's Planck with not capital letters, it has to do with quantum gravity domain, and uppercase letters is the, is the, is the satellite collaboration. So the characteristic features here are that there is a synergy between detailed calculations in, um, uh, in, not, in rather new conceptual frameworks and the ongoing state of art observations. And as I just mentioned, this is main, mainly, the, the, this is a very short paper, so the results are, are in here. But this really was developed soon after the, the 
the 2015 Planck uh, release of data uh, in 2016 that framework was developed and it is now being applied to the 2018 Planck data. So I got basically these four, talk, four topics. First, universe according to Planck. I mean, I excuse this, is, uh, excuse myself because uh, the, the, the real ex experts here who do the real work, and here I'm just summarizing for people who might be in other areas who are not uh, associated with the Planck collaboration directly. And then I'll tell you about loop quantum cosmology and loop quantum gravity. And again, I'm not going to assume that you know anything about these subjects. And then finally, the results about how the uh, ideas from loop quantum cosmology actually uh, alleviate some tensions in the CMB anomalies. Okay, so the universe according to Planck. Uh, so motivated by the inflation, one generally assumes that the primordial power spectrum, so this really is a primordial, not the, really the seeds, much, much before CMB epoch, uh, this primordial power spectrum is nearly scale invariant and there is a standard answers, which I will abbreviate by as A, this just means the standard answers, that the, the curvature perturbations, the power spectrum for them is, or it's also called the scalar mode, the power spectrum for them is given by an amplitude, a scalar, and this is the co-moving wave number, and k star is kind of a fiducial wave number, and ns minus one, ns is a parameter. So if ns is uh, less than one, then there is going to be uh, more power at smaller k's, so there is actually a red tilt to the power spectrum, and that's what we find. So s is a scalar mode amplitude, ns is called the spectral index, k star is a pivot mode, and it was chosen by Planck to be about 0 0.05 uh, uh, megaparsec to the minus one. Now to evolve this primordial per per perturbations using astrophysics, one needs to specify four other parameters. So we've got two parameters, AS and NS, and now we have four more parameters. There are matter densities in baryons and cold dark matter, and they will dictate the acoustic oscillations, so to say, between this primordial time and between the surface of last scattering. And then there are two other parameters, the 100 times theta mc, which is the angular scale of the acoustic oscillations in the sky, mega clusters, and reionization optical depth tau. So I got six parameters, AS, NS, uh, omega b, omega c, and then finally 100 theta mc, and so the uh, barrier oscillation, angular scale in sky today, and then there is a uh, optical depth up here. Given this, any choice of these parameters, astrophysics to the Boltzmann code, for example, determines the four correlation functions. They are the temperature temperature correlation functions. L here starts, what one is doing is one is just doing, uh, we, we see the CMB in the sky, and we're just doing YLM decomposition. And just by symmetry, it is clear that nothing is going to depend. If you give me one point, and I'm looking at a correlation with some other point, then nothing is going to depend on, on the M angle. Everything will just depend on the theta. And therefore, what matters is just the, in the YLM, just the L. So we get here the, the temperature, temperature, temperature and electric polarization, electric polarization, electric polarization. And then this is the lensing um, the, uh, correlation function. So you make these answers, you assume values for the six parameters, and then the code gives you these four uh, correlation functions. And then you can just, this is sort of say the theoretical prediction that is coming in starting from these answers up here. And, but these four relation uh, functions can be measured observationally. And so the comparison between theoretical predictions and the observations provide probability distribution functions for the six cosmological parameters. And the mean values of the marginalized PDFs provide us values of the six parameters, uh, which uh, together with their one sigma spreads, and then that determine the particular lambda CDA model that we, we live in. And so this is the universe according to the Planck. And so this, of course, has, as you all know, spectacular successes. You've all seen this many, many times. The lambda CDA model selected by the Planck data has tremendous success in explaining all the major features that we see up here um, in the temperature and astrotropies and polarization of the cosmic microwave background. And furthermore, 
in this model what has then knowing that I got this particular lambda CDA model, the standard lambda CDA model, we can ca make theoretical predictions for other observables such as lensing amplitude and the odd parity BB power spectrum uh, that can be tested independently by future observations. So that is where we are, this great success up here. Um, and again, as usual, you know, there is always in the, how the physics always works, right? I mean, first there is great euphoria, there's all these things are great and are working well and we understand. And then of course, we being physicists are greedy and we want to understand more, right? So we want to sort of test it with finer comb and see what happens. And that is what we try to do. And when we do that, there are certain anomalies. The significance of each of these anomalies is rather small, but taken together, it looks like we might be living in a rather exceptional universe. And that's why the Planck team itself has said that, well, you know, these anomalies are something that is worth looking at. So these are, I just chosen just two up here. The first one really goes back to this power spectrum. And we can see that this, this is the YLM else up here. And at low else, which is to say large angular scales in the sky, you see that in fact the observed power is below the power that is predicted by the standard answers, so there is power suppression. And then Planck team itself, but also a whole bunch of other theoretical people, um, leading cosmologists, Scopey, Schwarz, Spurgel, Starkman, they have suggested that a kind of a better measure for uh, this, 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 uh, uh, understanding this power suppression is to look at the, in the real space, look at the correlation function between two points as a function of theta. So it's really previously it was in terms of YLM, that is what we had previously. We are looking at here L into L plus 1, CL. So this was a YLM decomposition and now we are looking at, in, looking at just C theta. And then what one finds is that the observed spectrum is this and this is the Planck observed spectrum up here. And we're grateful that this, it's, it's rather tricky to get this observed power spectrum because of the, uh, you know, in the galactic plane, there is some masking that is done. And we're grateful that the Planck team actually helped us getting, uh, getting this in our, in, in, our, in our program up here, this, this scheme up here. And then there is a, the standard model prediction up here. And you can see that the standard model has kind of large deviation, it's not flat. In this region, this is the large angular scales. There, the spectrum seems to be observed once nearly flat, and then there are deviations up here that we see. And then there is a second anomaly, which has to do with lensing, lensing amplitude. So there is this lensing amplitude, which is called just AL. Oops. There's a lensing amplitude, which is just called AL up here, and this is the optical depth. And if I look at the one sigma contours and the two sigma contours, so 68% confidence level, 95% confidence level, we see that the value of AL equal to 1, which is a theoretically preferred value, this would say that we understand lensing incorporated correctly, is outside the one sigma contour up here. So therefore, as a result of that, this lies outside the one sigma contour, and this has led the, to a recent suggestion by some people that that there may be a possible crisis in cosmology. So they wanted to change the standard cosmological model to actually bring this point into the one sigma. And then they said that a natural way to do this is to introduce spatial curvature. So the universe is not spatially flat, but the truth is a three sphere. And the, but however, when you do that, in order to bring this to one sigma, then new problems arise. And that is why they, they said this. Now, I know that many in the Planck team and many other people don't take this too seriously, but some of the younger people that I've talked to were quite impressed by this. Therefore, I would like to sort of mention that uh, it, the conclusion is going to be there is no such crisis as we'll see in a minute up here. That's why I am including it up here. I just want to say that in terms of the C theta, a better measure of the C theta is really take C theta squared and measure it from 60 degrees to 180 degrees, and that is called S1 half just because of cos of 60 degrees is one half, so it's called S one half. And people often measure this quantity to, and to capture the global feature of this power suppression up here. Okay, so should we be success, concerned? As I already said, the statistical significance of any of these anomalies, any one of these anomalies is low, 
But taken together, they imply that we live in a quite a special realization of the probability distribution function that is predicted by the standard ANSA, by the standard lambda CDA model. And in fact, I myself was quite inspired to look into this problem a few years ago. And this was because there was a quote like this also in the Planck 215 data release. But in the 216, 218 data release on the paper on results, overview and the cosmological legacy of Planck, there is this quote which says that if any of these anomalies have primordial origin, then their large scale nature would suggest an explanation rooted in fundamental physics. Thus, it is worth exploring any models that might explain the anomaly, even better, multiple anomalies, naturally or with very few parameters. So therefore, the question is, if it is primordial, then maybe it has something with quantum gravity. That's why we started looking at it. And the conclusion is going to be yes. In fact, two of the anomalies that I mentioned are elevated by quantum gravity effects. How does this happen? Well, the standard answers is something that is given by this. It is almost nearly scale invariant, and s minus n is close to 1, so it's nearly scale invariance up here. So at, at first, it surprises, it, it may seem surprising that, uh, that the standard answers could be modified, this is a primordial spectrum, could be modified by quantum gravity effects. But in loop quantum cosmology, it turns out that the primordial spectrum is in, indeed nearly scale invariant, but only for large k. So at large angular scales, so small k is large angular scales, the story is different. At large angular scales, there is power suppression already at the primordial level, which alleviates, turns out as you will see, alleviates the two anomalies I mentioned. And, this, and thus, the possibility that was raised by Planck is actually realized in loop quantum cosmology. And in this sense, this could be taken as a manifestation of quantum gravity in the sky. Any time something like this happens, it is very exciting. One would like to take it seriously. And of course, one has to explore it further and further to see if it meets more and more tests. So this is the beginning, but this is the exciting phase of, beginning of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the investigation. So I'm through with the first part of the talk, which is the universe according to Planck. And now let me tell you about loop quantum cosmology. So I'm changing gears now to, to talk about this. Um, so now I just mentioned that maybe what we have to do is to change the standard answers which was motivated by inflation. And if we're going to change it, then you know, what, 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 is the, what is the motivation for that? Okay, so the inflationary paradigm has had tremendous successes in providing primordial quantum fluctuations that grew to the CMB anisotropies that are observed by the Planck satellite. However, the inflationary paradigm has some limitations. There are limitations which come from particle physics perspective, Namely, you know, which, what is the inflaton field? Is there one or many? How does it interact with standard model, with standard matter, and so on and so forth. And then there are also things from space-time perspective, which were emphasized by more gravitational people like Pranin Berger, uh, Jerome Marta, who is here, Starobinsky, and so on. Namely, that the paradigm continues to use general relativity with its Big Bang singularity. So of course, because it is a Big Bang singularity, we cannot specify the initial conditions at the Big Bang, at the beginning, because it's singular, it's infinite. Right? So the initial conditions are specified for the perturbations, cosmological perturbations, a little bit later. So to say, in the evolutionary history of this universe, it is specified uh, so this, in the middle, a little bit later, after, not, not at the very beginning up here, not in the Planck domain not regime, but already in the general relativity regime. And it is general relativity regime because at the beginning of inflation, the relevant part of the inflation, uh, slow roll, uh, part of, uh, relevant part of the slow roll, the space-time curvature is about 10 to the minus 11 times Planck curvature, and therefore we need a quantum theory of gravity to go beyond. The viewpoint up here is that we shouldn't, this is something that was proposed by Jim Peebles, that don't regard inflation as a fundamental theory, but rather as a framework on which to hang a fundamental theory. And what this talk, if you like, is a talk in which points to a direction in which one could find such a fundamental theory on which we could hang inflationary scenario. So basically, it's like a inflation gives you, gives you a frame, and then we have to actually put in the fundamental theory from which this, this, this particular framework would arise. Note in particular, I want to emphasize this for students, not for anybody else, that one often thinks of 
when the CMB, cosmic microwave background itself, or success of inflation, says that there was a big bang. And I want to emphasize that this is not the case, because CMB occurred you know, 380,000 years later, it doesn't really care about what happened in the Big Bang or near the Big Bang up here. And the same thing is true with inflation, because inflation is something where the space-time curvature starts to be 10 to the minus 11 times Planck curvature, and in fact weakens very rapidly as the universe expands exponentially. And therefore, we really need a quantum theory of gravity to go beyond that. And I want to emphasize that Einstein himself, at least towards the end of his life, was completely aware that we should not trust the predictions of the Big Bang very seriously. We should not take them very seriously. And here's a quote from his book, which says, one may not assume the validity of field equations, Einstein's equation, at very high density of field and matter. And one may not conclude that the beginning of the expansion should be a singularity in the mathematical sense. So what we are going to do is, we are really looking at a particular quantum theory of gravity to go to the past of the onset of inflation towards the Big Bang and then see what happens there. So indeed, conceptually, quantum gravity effects change the whole the story qualitatively, as we'll see. And I will focus on loop quantum cosmology, the cosmological sector of loop quantum gravity. And there is an excellent agreement with inflation at small angular scales, at large k, there's excellent agreement. But, at scale, at, but, but there are departures at large scales. Uh, large angular scales that are departures when the CAB anomalies lie. So therefore, there is a, some idea that maybe this is something that one, one could take seriously. So what I would like to do is to tell you, take a small detour about loop quantum gravity, because I know that most people here, uh, particularly students and so on, would not know much about loop quantum gravity or quantum gravity in general. That's what I learned in the, in the session I had with students just before, the, before this talk. So recall that general relativity is founded on Einstein's outrageous idea. And the outrageous idea is that gravity is not a force, but it is a manifestation of curved space-time. And because of this, general relativity needed a new syntax to describe classical physics in presence of gravity. And that new syntax in which we describe the world in general relativity is, as, we call, as you know, is called the Riemannian geometry. It's a differential geometry, Riemannian geometry, that is what we use in general relativity. In loop quantum gravity, the viewpoint is that geometry is a physical entity. Just Einstein's equation relate matter with gravity, uh, with geometry. And they say that in presence of ma matter, geometry actually is affected. It's not a neutral object up here. It is actually a dynamical object. It is affected by matter, and it affects matter. Now, matter has atomic structure. This table looks completely smooth to me. But we know it has atomic structure. And the idea there is that if, in fact, geometry is a physical entity, then perhaps it also has some microscopic structure, quote unquote, atomic structure. And this atomic structure is something that we should explore. And the continuum I see in space around me is just a coarse grained approximation, just as this table looks smooth is a coarse, coarse grained approximation. So that is the idea of loop quantum gravity. And therefore, we need a new syntax to describe this physics, in quantum physics, in presence of uh, quantum gravity, not classical gravity, but quantum gravity. And this new syntax was developed systematically over a decade by a whole bunch of people, and that is called quantum Riemannian geometry. And we can use the framework of quantum Riemannian geometry to write down the quantum version of Einstein's equation and then explore their consequences. Uh, this is ongoing work, there's a lot of progress that is done, but we're not by no means finished. And yet, we can apply the framework to specific contexts like cosmology or black holes, and there is very, very active work in both these areas. For students, there is an introductory outreach YouTube video, uh, which is called The Story of Loop Quantum Gravity from the Big Bang to, the big, to, to Black Holes. And you can see here how the theory developed, and uh, th this might be a good, good introduction for you. Okay. So the quantum geometry, the idea is the following, that if you look at the atomic the atoms of matter, so for example, the simplest one, hydrogen atom, then we got, in the classical theory, it's a Kepler problem. And for the Kepler problem, we are observables. We have got energy, angular momentum as observables. Classically, they take on continuous value. Quantum mechanically, they are represented by operators. And these operators take only discrete values. So the same thing is true about geometry. 
the area of this table, right, area of the surface of this table is observable in general relativity. It has this particular value because we are in the metric space-time geometry, which is in this room. If I took the same surface in a strong gravitational field, for example, near a black hole, its area would be different because the geometry is different. So it's an observable. In quantum loop quantum gravity, these observables actually translate to operators. And those operators have purely discrete eigenvalues. So in a literal sense, just as in a hydrogen atom, energy is quantized, angular momentum is quantized. Here, the geometric observables like area of a physical surface, area of a physical a volume of a physical uh, region, they are all discrete. The, uh, the eigenvalues are all discrete up here. The continuum arises as a coarse grain approximation. So it's like an, this impressionist picture. You know, if you go closely, then you don't see any structure in it in the usual sense. You just see this dot, 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 dot. And that is like the loop quantum gravity uh, microstructure. But if you coarse grain, you look at it from further, then you see these simple continuum structures arising up here. The discrete eigenvalues furthermore crowd exponentially as they grow. And because they crowd exponentially, the, uh, the continuum is reached rather quickly and general relativity becomes a good approximation rather quickly. But fundamental discreteness of quantum geometry, in particular the smallest non-zero eigenvalue of area, so there is a zero eigenvalue of area and then there is a non-zero eigenvalue of area, it is called the area gap, that plays a crucial role at the Planck scale physics. As we will see in the cosmological models, all strong curvature singularities are resolved in loop quantum gravity. Uh, and, and we're not putting any exotic matter, there's no new thing, it's just resolved because of quantum geometry. And physical quantities such as density, curvature, and isotropies that diverge at the Big Bang, they all remain finite and furthermore have absolute upper bounds on physical states. And these upper bounds are completely governed by the area gap. So this is the microscopic parameter which governs all these macroscopic parameters in the theory. So what happens up here? So what we would naturally to ask now, OK, I just mentioned to you that the singularities are resolved. So we'd like to know, what is the mechanism? What happens in loop quantum gravity? So the first thing is that there is no unphysical matter, or there are no new boundary conditions, like the Hartle-Hawking boundary con condition. There's nothing put in by hand there. Rather, it is just the dynamics of loop quantum gravity, the quantum corrected Einstein's equations of loop quantum gravity that create a brand new repulsive force. But this repulsive force is operational. It becomes significant only in the Planck regime, only the quantum gravity regime. And there, it overwhelms the classical attraction and therefore halts the collapse. And the Big Bang is replaced by Big Bounds. This has been analyzed in detail using the Hamiltonian methods, path integral methods, consistent fra histories framework methods, etc. Very, very, all, very thoroughly up here. In the Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker models, the quantum Einstein's equation dictate the relational evolution of the wave function of the quantum geometry. The wave function depends on the scale factor and, for example, the inflaton field or whatever scale of matter fields that you may have up here. And observables such as matter density and curvature, they are first of all operators and these operators have eigenvalues and these eigenvalues have an upper bound and therefore it is bounded above on all solutions of the quantum corrected Einstein's equation. The universal upper bounds are determined by inverse powers of the area gap, for example, the rho sup, the maximum value of the energy density which is infinite in, in general relativity is given by some constant divided by area gap cube. If you take the continuum limit and let, forget about the quantum geometry and let lambda goes to zero, then this goes to infinity, that is a classical result. So they diverge in the classical limit and therefore this is very similar to what happens in a hydrogen atom as was desired by John Wheeler many times. In a hydrogen atom, the ground state energy is just given by two, uh, the mass of the electron e to the fourth upon two h bar squared as h bar goes to zero, it goes to minus infinity, and we have the classical infinity. But in quantum theory, it is finite. Similarly here, this is completely finite. There are many generalizations. There are several thousand papers on loop quantum cosmology, inclusion of spatial curvature, cosmological constant, inflaton potential, anisotropies, simplest inhomogeneities, and so on. And the qualitative summary is the following. 
every time a curvature scalar starts growing in classical general relativity and enters a Planck regime, in classical general relativity it keeps growing and becomes infinite. Here, in quantum geometry, repulsive force dilutes it, preventing a blow up, and the Big Bang is replaced by a big bounce. And therefore, the quantum space time is vastly larger than general relativity space time. Space time does not stop at the Big Bang singularity or the black hole singularity. There is a quantum extension of space time. This, by the way, has also very interesting implications which are, which are being explored, but there are some major progress than last year for, for the information loss issue for black holes because we do not have a singularity, therefore the issue changes. Okay. So, for example, here is an example of a Starobinsky potential, which is preferred in inflation I mean, uh, by, by the observational data. It's an inflationary model, and the inflaton potential, I, we're using that. Here is the kind of the volume of any fixed co-moving region in the universe. And what happens to the physical volume? The physical volume grows exponentially, as we see up here. And here is, a, is a, what, what the inflaton is doing. So, inflation starts somewhere here. And the inflaton descends down the potential. And as it descends down the potential during inflation, the, there's an exponential a increase in the volume. However, if you were to take this solution and evolve it uh, backward in time towards the Big Bang singularity, then you would find that in classical general relativity, the, the inflaton turns around, the volume decreases, and finally it goes to zero. But in, general, in loop quantum cosmology, there is a quantum region which is where Einstein's equations are modified in a greatly and that causes a bounce. And the same thing is true for the m squared phi squared potential which people often consider that the, expect that the, the Big Bang singularity is actually resolved naturally in this case. Okay. So, what I have told you so far is basically that there is a loop quantum gravity the Riemannian geometry of general relativity, the continuum of general relativity is replaced by some quantum Riemannian geometry and the observables which classical relativity like areas or volumes, geometrical observables take continuous values, take only, have only discrete eigenvalues. And I will not explain to you exactly how this happens, but the detailed, detailed analysis shows that as a result the quantum, the, there are quantum corrections to Einstein's equations, the Friedman equation, the right other equation. There's a consistent set of new equations, and with these new equations, the singularity is resolved. So you might say, big deal, singularity is resolved, fine, but how do we, do we see it in any time in observations? Why should it matter at all? And the usual point that one, one makes is the following, that in standard inflation, which is on the left-hand side, general relativity, you took at, look at the modes which are observable, and the idea is that they are all inside the curvature radius. What matters for this mode is curvature radius. If the wavelength of the mode is larger than the cur curvature radius, they get excited. If the wavelength of the modes is smaller than the curvature radius, they don't feel the curvature. <laughs> Heuristically, it's like my walking on the surface of the earth. I don't feel the curvature because my wavelength, my footstep, is much smaller than the curvature radius of the earth up here. So, the same thing happens in this propagation equations. One can show it explicitly with the detailed equation up here. And so, the idea is that the observable modes before the onset of inflation are all supposed to be inside the horizon. And because they are inside the horizon, they are not affected, and therefore they, they just come out. And when they exit the Hubble horizon, they will be in the ground state, the so called bulge Davis vacuum. Okay? So that is the idea up here, they are not excited and then something happens, they get stretched and something happens up here. On the other hand, in loop quantum gravity, something else happens. We have got this curvature radius here, the curvature it becomes infinity at the Big Bang, so the curvature radius goes to zero. Here, in loop quantum cosmology, the curvature goes to a finite value and therefore the curvature radius also goes to a finite value, it does not go to zero. And therefore, we can have observable modes whose wavelength at the bounce is larger than the curvature, rather than the curvature radius. When this happens, then these modes get excited in the Planck regime. And then when they come out, at the end of inflation, they are not in the bunch, or at the beginning of inflation, they are not in the Bunch-Davis vacuum. And because they are not in the Bunch-Davis vacuum, the statement is that 
uh, these more, the, the predictions of, of loop quantum gravity is quite different from that of, of standard inflation based on general relativity. Notice what is happening up here. The Big Bang singularity is resolved because of the ultraviolet corrections to Einstein's equations. Because the curvature becomes infinite here and that is actually tamed by the loop quantum geometry effects. On the other hand, as a result, if I look at the perturbations, it is the perturbations which are the longest wavelength, which are going to be, which are going to be affected, which are going to be excited, and there will be differences up here. So the difference is really because of this deep interplay between the ultraviolet and the infrared. It is the longest wavelength modes which will be excited. And now it may ring a bell that we have seen these anomalies at the largest angular scale. So they are the largest angular, uh, largest uh, wavelength modes. So these modes would behave differently in loop quantum cosmology than in standard inflation, and therefore we would have different predictions. And that is exactly what happens. Okay. So that is now let me tell you what these predictions are and then I have, have a few uh, points of discussion. So what happens to the primordial power spectrum? So what I have done here is I have taken the ratio of the power spectrum coming from loop quantum gravity divided by the power spectrum that is given by standard inflation by the standard answers of nearly scale invariant power spectrum. And as you can see here that for for the large case up here, the power spectrum is there, they are identical. It, it, can, it goes on for the all observable modes up here. However, for small k, there is a power suppression up here. And what we have done up here is considered two potentials, Starobinsky potential and quadratic potential. And you can see that the difference are very small. In both cases, there is this power suppression. So there seems to be a power suppression in the primordial spectrum that is coming up. So instead of having the standard answers, which is nearly scale invariant for all k, now it is nearly scale invariant only for large k, but for small k, it is not scale invariant. So we have got some function f of k up here, and this f of k is equal to 1 for large k, but it is actually less than 1 for small k up here. So there is a primordial power suppression up here. Um, so this then, we are Boltzmann. Um, uh, we do the, what I said in the very beginning of the talk, we use the Boltzmann code, take this primordial power spectrum, evolve it, then try to find the best fit parameters for the standard, for the uh, cosmological model, and we find these parameters, and these parameters are somewhat different from the, the parameters in the standard lambda CDM that were given in Planck based on the standard answers. So here in black, these dots are the obser observed Planck values up here with the error bars. Then we have got here the, the spectrum that is predicted by the standard answers, by standard inflation, and then there is a power suppression up here. And you can see more, more clearly up here that already the power suppression starts here at about L equal to 30, and between 30 and 20, and 30, you know, there, there is this power suppression. It grows much more here, but there is already power suppression in this range up here. Um, so now, I had mentioned to you before that you know, one way of quantifying this power suppression would be to convert from the CLMs, the YLM decomposition, into the angular decomposition, right, to see what happens to the correlations in angles up here. And here are the correlation functions C of theta in angles. And what we see up here is basically that this is what the observed thing is. This is what the standard model gives us. And this is what the LQC prediction is. So we should really compare from about 60 degrees onwards. And from 60 degrees onwards, the state statement is that, in fact, indeed, the, there is a, the LQC prediction is closer. So we can calculate this S1 half that I had a while ago. S1 half was just given by taking the C theta squared and integrating it, right? So it was just given by S1 half was just equal to given by integral of of uh, minus 1 to 1 half of d cos theta times c theta squared. So it really accumulates the, the power in this uh, at angles bigger than 60 degrees. It's positive definite quantity. And that in the standard inflation is s1 half is about um, uh, 40, 42,496 
it is reduced to 143,000, sorry, 14,308. So there is, this was 42,000, this is 14,000. So there is a two thirds reduction in this, in this power suppression. So the quantitatively this explains that there is a, there is a substantial power suppression in loop quantum cosmology. So in that sense, the anomaly, if you like, is, is alleviated. What about the anomaly about the, uh, about the scattering amplitude, about the lensing amplitude and the reionization optical depth? Again, we got these two plots up here. In red, this plot up here is the standard model up here, the standard cosmological model with the based on the standard answers. And A equal to 1, which is the desired value, lies outside 1 sigma. It does lie within 2 sigma, but uh, within 2 sigma, but it lies outside 1 sigma. And now, in loop quantum cosmology, the contour looks this way, and therefore this is brought into 1 sigma. So therefore, again, this is elevated. There is no longer a motivation to introduce spatial curvature, and therefore there is no possible crisis in cosmology uh, with, this, with this effect up here. Uh, so one might say, well, okay, there is a standard model, cosmological model, and now we also have the LQC. So how do the parameters comp uh, compare with each other? So we can see that the ones which are in black, they are very close to each other. The maximum difference is about 0.4%. So four parts in a thousand between the standard model and the, what LQC is asking us to do. However, for the optical depth, the difference is about 9.8%. And of course, for this S1 half, as we just saw before, the S1 half in the, in the in LQC, in a standard model is about 300% higher than in LQC up here. So this is the main difference up here with this optical depth and this up here. And there will be, of course, this is still uh, all within error bars, this difference, even though it is 9.8%. But there are experiments which are planned, uh, observations that are planned, I understand, which will be actually measure the optical depth to a percent accu level accuracy. And then the statement is that one will be able to distinguish between them. So there is a prediction. It may be falsified, but there is a prediction uh, of coming from quantum gravity. So I want to emphasize, I come from more, I'm, I was born as a mathematical physicist, right? I mean, to me, going into cosmology and looking at phenomenology was a big trip and big adventure. Learned a lot, it was enjoyable and such thing. But for years, I always felt that quantum gravity was all living in this perch of, you know, pristine mathematical physics perch, which is completely removed from anything that is testable. And the very fact that we can test something to me, I mean, whether it's right or wrong, it's good. I mean, if it's wrong, then we know that we made some mistake in our uh, assumptions, and we'll talk about it in a minute. And so that will tell us something. So it's bringing quantum gravity to the level of ordinary physics where, you know, you confront experiments. And that, to me, that is the exciting part. I know that most of you are observers, most of you are really down-to-earth physicists, and you want to. And so these are very small effects. But nonetheless, there are some predictions that could be ruled out, that could be tested, and so that is what is interesting for me. Okay, so the last part, which is just discussions. First, let me just summarize, um, and then the oops. Um, let us recall this quote from Planck, uh, from the Planck paper. Oops, I keep pushing the wrong button. Uh, the quote from the Planck collaboration: If anomalies have primordial origin and here is an example in which they have primordial origin. The, the spectrum is scale invariant for large k, but not for small k. And then the large scale nature of them suggests an explanation rule to routine in fundamental physics. Indeed, that's exactly what we saw up here. Thus, it is worth exploring any models that might explain an anomaly, or even better, multiple anomalies. Here I looked at two. People are working also on non-Gaussianity. People are working on, it's not an anomaly, but it's a good test. And the one is also looking at the hemispherical anomaly. I have not done that. This is the ongoing work for us. Uh, but the other people in loop quantum cosmology using slightly different approaches are looking at that. Okay, what we saw is that loop quantum cosmology provides a concrete illustration of the desired primordial mechanism suggested here to significantly alleviate two anomalies. This specific scheme also makes other predictions that could be tested in the upcoming observation mission. I already mentioned the optical depth. And there is also a different spectrum for the R parity dB uh, polarized, 
polarization up here, that the future B, B board missions will, will probe and see what happens up here. And work is in progress, as I mentioned, about these uh, other anomalies up here. And so I think that there are standard questions that come up, so I thought I'll just, in my own talk, sort of address some of them, and then I'll take any other questions that you have. The first question is, they raise some natural questions, and I will address a few of them. Now one might say, okay, so these anomalies got elevated, but what was the difference fundamentally? The difference was in the primordial spectrum. Now we had a well-motivated reason from loop quantum cosmology to derive, to arrive at this primordial spectrum. But supposing somebody else arrived at a primordial spectrum, which also agreed for large k with a standard scale invariant one, nearly scale invariant one, but at small k is the power is suppressed. Then would I get the same results, similar results, what happens to that? I have to confess that I have not thought about this before. It's only after obtaining these results. It's only in the month of December that I thought about this. And it turns out that yes, in, indeed, Again, those who are interested afterwards, I'll explain how this argument goes. But indeed, there is an argument. So after seeing the LQC results, we found general arguments that says that in any scheme, the best fit mean values of the optical depth, so any scheme which actually has a property that for large k, you've got nearly scale invariant, but for, large, for, for small k, we've got a power suppression in the primordial spectrum. Then in such scheme, you you, you would find that the best fit mean value of the optical depth tau would be larger than in the standard scenario, and that of the lensing amplitude would be lower. It would be pushed closer to, um, closer to one, and this would be pushed up, uh, higher up here, in some sense alleviating a little bit of a dispute or tension there was between uh, WMAP and the, and the Planck. Um, and therefore, the tension between these two C and B anomalies will be reduced, the one the, about, the optic, about the lensing amplitude and about the power suppression at large angular scales. This implication of prim primordial power suppression appears not to have been noticed before. But of course, it is not, cl it is not clear which aspects of primordial power spectrum are necessary and sufficient for the, uh, uh, for the reduction of this tension. In other words, I don't, I mean, we, we use a particular form of the power suppression up here, and that is what gave us this 9.8 percent, etc. What exactly in is the characteristic of this power suppression that gives us this reduct, uh, increase of the optical depth by 9.8 percent? I, I don't know that. That's something that would be good to check. And also the new predictions that we have, for example, the R parity BB and the optical depth, for example, they, may, they will depend on the precise form of the power suppression. But still, qualitatively, the phenomena we found can be traced back to the power suppression. I think the power suppression in the, in the, in the low K was first not taken too seriously because of there are large uh, cosmic variants, there are large error bars there. But the primordial power su suppression has other uh, implications other than just reducing the observed power in the CMB at, uh, at low Ls. It has other predictions and that is something that we, I, I have an argument which shows how this will come about. And then the second one is that another natural question is, what sets the scale at which the power suppression occurs? We had this L equal to 30 or K equal to whatever it is. So what, how did it come about? Well, it really goes back to this particular picture that I had. Namely, we know which modes are going to be affected. Those modes whose wavelength, physical wavelength at the bounds is larger than the curvature radius predicted by LQC. The curvature radius predicted by LQC is universal, so it gives us a certain, certain number and we have to look at this wavelength. So the question is really, this is the one that is going to really set the scale up here, uh, the curvature radius. So we can go back and say what happens to this curvature radius. So the, I'm, instead of talking about curvature radius, I'm now talking about curvature. So instead of talking about wavelength, I have to talk about wave numbers. So the statement is that the curvature up here, the maximum curvature happens to be about 62 in Planck units. And dynamical equations obeyed by the modes, they imply, as we said, I explained before, that if the physical wavelength of a mode is much smaller than the curvature radius, the mode is not affected, but otherwise uh, the curvature will excite it. And this sets a scale. And this scale is really scale of the physical wave number at the bounds. But it turns out that because of the initial conditions we, 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 we have, 
we can translate this into co-moving wave numbers and it's about 4 times 10 to the minus 2. So basically that is where there's going to be the curve, the mode is going to really feel the curvature strongly. So in practice what happens is the mode starts feeling the curvature when the number k, wave number k is, um, is about 10 times larger or the wavelength is about 10 times smaller. So again, if I go back to these various plots that we had, oops, various plots I have. So the curvature scale that I'm talking about that is given by about um, uh, somewhere, uh, yeah, it, it is somewhere here, the curvature scale is somewhere here, that is the, here the, 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 the effects are going to be extremely strong below this scale and for much larger scale they are going to be very, very weak up here. And then the detailed calculations say that well, the effect starts becoming visible, becoming, if in fact the curvature scale is about 10 or 12 times larger than the curvature radius that is given up here. And then you start the seeing the effect about uh, 10 to the minus 3 times, 4 times 10 to the minus 3. So you start seeing it here. Um, and then the last thing that I want to say is, um, okay. So that, that's, that's that what says, 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 sets the scale at which the effect becomes important. Then the last question people would ask is, well, why is there power suppression rather than power enhancement at large angular scale? If the modes get excited, why isn't there more power? Well, quantum mechanics is subtle, right? Quantum mechanics, there is interference effects, and these interference effects can be either constructive or destructive. And now, it all depends on detail on the, on the initial conditions. So the initial conditions were put on perturbations from considerations of really quantum considerations. Basically, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, what we are asking is that in the Planck regime, the initial state should be maximally isotropic and uh, homogeneous. Trouble is it cannot be exactly isotropic and homogeneous because of uncertainties that are induced by, by the, un, because of uncertainty principle. It says that this is not possible. And therefore, we have to have certain minimum uncertainties. It requires a very careful analysis of the Planck regime and that was done and that is how the initial conditions were set. But it is those initial conditions that really matter. Now in the inflationary scenario, one cannot choose the initial condi conditions of the Big Bang because of singularity. One chooses them, so to say, in the middle of evolution, positing that the state should be bunch Davis vacuum a few e folds before the modes of interest exit the Hubble horizon or the curvature radius, which is the same thing during inflation. In LQC, one can choose them at the bounds or in the Planck scale, Planck regime around the bounds. And a new principle is used to select them and that enforces maximum quantum homogeneity and isotropy in the Planck regime allowed by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And it is this initial state automatically leads to power suppression. So the results I have presented are a mixture of two things. Dynamics of loop quantum gravity which introduces quantum corrections to Einstein's equation and choice of initial conditions. You need both of those things. So it is a combined test of both of those things. When we proposed those initial conditions in 2016 for you know, conceptual reasons, we said explicitly that, well, this is the first stab at the initial conditions. We have to, we have to see if this, these are viable. It could have been that those initial conditions are already ruled out because they give us large deviations at, at small angular scale. At large k, there's, there's a large deviation in the power spectrum. Are they EE, TE, anything like that? That did not happen. And furthermore, it is actually helping alleviate these anomalies. So the viewpoint now is that, okay, there's something right about those initial conditions. So we should take them seriously and in fact refine them and you know, keep working, uh, keep, keep pushing the frontier until some problem arises and then we'll know how to correct them. So this is a good, good encouragement to continue the research up here. So as I said, Results that I reported offer encouragement to us to pursue other consequences of the loop of quantum dynamics and the initial conditions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, there are some questions already. Uh, so one of the ways that the uh, tension between uh, uh, different observations of the uh, standard model uh, is demonstrated 
is through plots of the uh, calculation of the uh, Hubble constant. Have you, uh, do you have a plot where you have a distribution of the Hubble constant? Yes, but I think it is very, very close to the, the standard model of, 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 small, so of the... So it the still differs strongly from the... Um, yeah, it differs. Very the so <laughs> it increases, but it increases like in the decimal place. The, the mean values is not, not very, very different from, uh, for the Hubble constant, yeah. So okay. the cosmological Hubble, Hubble constant is the same as in the... Uh, it's something that one might expect because the other one might have to do with local structure or something and not about the cosmological one. I think there's a question in the back. Oh. Oh. Sorry. Thanks. Thanks. A very nice talk. I, um, of course, uh, look quantum gravity is not the last uh, word. Um, what uh, I have two points to you. First, uh, the suppression of the uh, spectrum as large angular scales is um, very well, uh, besides other um, uh, predictions, very well uh, um, uh, reproduced by one, po one phase of inflation which uh, we have not uh, um, highlighted, that is the primordial one, faster roll inflation, namely the kinetic energy of the inflaton of the order of the inflaton potential, this is an attractor. This is purely semi-classical or classical if you want. This uh, has been, uh, I mean, by several groups as, as you know, including ourselves, and is very well checked besides the other predictions. So, um, the initial conditions are crucial there is no, uh, because the Bunch Davis, but precisely what, what you say, Bunch Davis is not in, a vacuum is not in the slow growth regime, but in be, uh, before, but not the quantum gravity. Inflation definitively with the anomalies and whatever is semi-classical gravity, which could be recovered from a more uh, complex theory, yours, uh, you know I have recent uh, work, etc., but it's, uh, definitely semi-classical, not quantum gravity. There are quantum corrections which are 10 minus 9. Okay, okay. Now, I do not know the details of this theory at all, but I have discussed with many people about these alternate explanations. I mean, um, uh, and then the, typically in the inflaton in potential, people have to introduce something like a fast roll phase before the slow roll phase. One has to change the potential a certain way and so on. And when I ask people, in fact, including people here, uh, the usual answer is that yes, but you know, it's, there's no fundamental explanation for that, something like that. Let, let me just finish, please. So I, I'm, not re, I'm not addressing your specific mechanism because I do not know it. I just know the certain mechanism that I'm addressing up here, uh, which we're, which, uh, and so, so basically, it's not it's, it's put by hand, and furthermore, typically one needs more parameters to be put put in by hand. And if you include, include those parameters, then the significance goes down because more the parameters, the less. Here, the good thing was that once the initial conditions were chosen by fundamental considerations, there were no new parameters. There may be, and for the last point that I want to make is, however, by no means I want to say that this is the only explanation. By no means, right? I mean. I think it's very nice that there are several ideas and they, those ideas should be pursued. So I did not really address the specific mechanism that you refer to because I do not know it. So I just addressed the general uh, other ideas that people have had that I, I am aware of. Yeah, I'm, I'm one of the guys working at the cold face of the observation, so to speak. So uh, your talk is very impressive to me, but um, can you just try to explain to us, the observers, because I always heard that you know there's no uh, theory of quantum gravity, right? So what would a theory of quantum gravity look like compared to what you're presenting here today? So there's no complete theory of quantum gravity. But what one can do is, <laughs> what one can do is one can actually, um, yeah, different, different approaches do different things. So let me just focus on loop quantum gravity and what we do. So there are, there are issues open as far as a complete quantum gravity theory, complete quantum character Einstein's equations would be. So that we do not know. But what we can do is we can look at sectors of the theory. So I can look at the black hole sector of the theory. I can look at the cosmological sector of the theory. Now there, 
there are enough symmetries that I can actually make much more progress than, 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 than in the full theory. And particularly in the cosmological sector, even more than the black hole sector, uh, the symmetries are sufficient that one can make really complete progress. So, in this case, we, you know, given the symmetry, this cosmological sector, we have very nice uniqueness theorems which say that there is no other way to do. If you, well, every theorem has assumptions, so we put, you know, the underlying diffeomorphism invariant of the theory and such things, and then the statement is that this, this is the only way to, which will satisfy the various conditions, and then we work it out in, in, in great detail. So, within the sector, it is pretty complete. I mean, I say pretty complete in the same sense, same sense as, you know, like QCD is pretty complete as far as LHC is concerned. I mean, there are, of course, things can be. But as a whole theory, right, going completely beyond it, we do not know. In the last two years, there have been very good attempts by, of starting with the full theory and in, uh, saying that whatever the theory is, we don't know what it is, but let's, let's suppose that there is some theory up there, uh, loop quantum gravity. I mean, we do know what a quantum geometry is completely. What we don't know is the, is the appropriate, a complete description of Einstein, quantum Einstein's equation. We have partial understanding, we don't have complete understanding. But attempts have been made, and very good attempts, that we start with this, this general theory, and I, yes, I don't know what the, what the ambiguities are in, in the full Einstein's equation. But I make choices that are up in the market, right? And we don't know which of them is correct. And then apply them to cosmological sector. So you don't begin with the cosmological sector. We begin with the full theory and apply them to cosmological sector. And then they get these effective equations. And there is very good agreement with the effective equations here. Again, it's work in progress. But in the last two years, there has been a lot of progress in these regions. So that, that, that is the same. In, in loop quantum gravity, uh, there is a fundamental unit for the area, which is obviously proportional to the square of the Planck lengths. However, the precise value is not known because there are arbitrary parameters uh, in the theory. Uh, and uh, these parameters, I think, will affect uh, all the predictions of the theory. So what have you chosen for these parameters? You fine tune them so that you have the power suppression at the right scale? Or? No. So, so no. So that's not what we do. So there is exactly one other part. If you like that, we don't know what the value, value of the area gap is in loop quantum gravity. If you, so people often talk about Barbary Mersey parameter. But you can say that is a parameter that comes up when you go from classical theory to the quantum theory. But you can say, I got a quantum theory. And I just want to talk about quantum theory by itself. What are the ambiguities? What do I need to fix the theory? I need to give you a value of this delta, of this, this area gap up here. So that we don't know what it is. So what we did was we fixed this value using arguments which come from black hole entropy. And then we, we did this calculation. But I did not have time to do this here. But another thing that we did was very interesting, which is just again an idea of a postdoc, not my idea. That he said, well, he's good with <laughs> data analysis. I'm horrible with data analysis. So he said that, well, why don't you keep this parameter as a variable? And then say that for each value of this parameter, we'll get some spectrum. Uh, we'll get some CMB, TT spectrum and find the, find the probability distribution of this parameter. Sorry, I should have put the graph up here. It is in the paper, okay, sorry. in the older paper, 2016 paper. And we find that the value that came from black hole parameter, black hole calculation. So I'm changing the rule now. I'm saying that, well, take the CMB as the observations, not black hole, and then find the area gap. And the value of the area gap, you get a probability distribution and the value that we have is, is completely within one sigma, quite close to the peak, but not at the peak. It's quite close to the peak up here, within one sigma of that. So if you like, this gives us, you can play the game the other way around by saying that, well, this gives us confidence also in the black hole calculation, which is completely independent. That never, they're, they're conceptually not related to each other at all. So there is this synergy. So to me, that's why this is a two-way bridge, because we are learning from observations into fundamental theory. We can put constraints on the area gap, which is the only unknown parameter from the fundamental theory. But the way the results are presented, I fix that parameter by black hole entropy calculation, and then went back. Excuse me. So since you're mentioning black holes, what happens to black holes in loop quantum gravity framework, in particular the singularity, horizon, all the questions? Right. So this is something that we addressed last year. There was a PRL and a PRL, PRD, and um, 
uh, viewpoint article on this I think. So, you can look up last year 2019. Um, sorry, it was end of 2018, December of 2018. Um, and the statement is the singularity is resolved. And what we did was the simple, simple case. We're not, okay, so I should go backtrack. You take something like the Kruskal space time, right, I mean, which is the Schwarzschild. It's not a dynamical black hole forming. Some, some black hole is given to you. And then the statement is that, well, we look at it from the loop quantum gravity perspective, look at the quantum corrections, and the black hole singularity is all. And black hole, the singularity, which is space like in Schwarzschild, is resolved and is replaced by what we call a transition surface. To the past of this transition surface, you have got trapped region. In other words, all light rays are converging, like in a black hole, if you like. And in the future of it, all light rays are diverging. So, as far as these are concerned, it's like a white hole. But there's no singularity, so I don't like to call it a white hole. And there's a transition. And then we can join on to an asymptotic region again to the future. And then this, however, has not been you know, taken over in detail for the collapsing situation. And that is what work in progress. One would like to understand, you know, if you take the collapse, I mean, we have the very good idea about what happens, but on the hand, it's different, to, different from having idea and actually proving it, and it, this has not been proved about the collapsing situation. But the, but the black hole picture was, was, yeah, it was quite a, and uh, other thing that people so often ask, gravitational wave people ask and so on, is really that, um, Will there be any signatures of quantum gravity? So we're also, of course, interested. I, I work also in gravitational waves, so I'm very interested in that. And the statement is that no, these corrections are so tiny for solar mass black hole, or you know, half a solar mass, or whatever you want to call, can consider a black hole. They're completely tiny. So this was not obvious, but it is true that. So again, it is one of those funny things, right? That that this the quantum geometry effects are extremely strong in the Planck regime, but they dilute away in loop quantum gravity away from the Planck regime very quickly. By the time you are at the horizon, the, the difference is with, with the classical theory is almost not there. There's one thing that I just want to say, which is related but not completely the same, which is really that, you know, we in gravitational waves so are very proud to say, well, you know, well, when I've seen this black hole collisions and such strong curvature, and, you know, so we have tested generally in the strong curvature regime or something like that. So one might ask, what was the curvature at the onset of inflation? It is 10 to the 65 times the curvature at the horizon of a solar mass black hole. So <laughs> inflationary theories are testing general relativity at such an incredibly high curvature compared to something like gravitational waves. To me, this is always very, very, very uh, amusing and surprising up here. It's a different kind of test, but still it is it's very, very If I understand correctly, uh, something which is very important in your model uh, is this uh, maximum uh, limited curvature. Therefore, any other model, uh, apart from uh, quantum loop gravity, uh, that puts some, uh, such, a, such a limit uh, can uh, somehow solve some of these pro problems that you are saying. However, you mentioned at the very beginning uh, that your, the space-time, the, 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 a feature in the in the in uh, quantum loop gravity, uh, we, which is special, is this uh, sort of discretization, quantization of the space-time. Do you think that it leaves any signature on the observables that even if we cannot see today? Uh, it would be probably because this uh, community here is mostly uh, observable. So probably would be uh, interested to see if uh, there is any signature which can distinguish between your model and any other model which solve the problem of singularity. Um, right. So the, the the statement is that as far as the cosmological observations are concerned. Uh, first thing is that this is a great question and we well looked at it in some detail. And as far as cosmological observations are concerned, it's very unlikely that one would actually be able to see the, see the signature of this precise discreteness. I mean, if some other model gives us a, the value of 62 Planck length squared as being the maximum scalar curvature, uh, then the quantitatively, the prediction will be the same. Quantitatively, it will not be the same because we have a specific geometry, specific equations, which are quantum corrections in them, and this 
and these perturbations are evolving in that geometry. In the other case, they will be evolving some other geometry, so the details will not be the same. But can I pinpoint the discreteness itself? No. So one place we, where this discreteness plays a big role for us is, um, is, a, is, a, is in calculation of black hole entropy. Now it's not an observable thing, but it's a theoretical coherence of, 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 the, whole, of, of the whole framework. So, so far in what we have done, the discreteness itself, I mean that you know, fundamental discreteness, that is really uses a bedrock for black hole entropy calculations, but not really for any, uh, any of the observable things that we have seen so far. So, so <coughs> uh, the, the curse uh, that we are confronted with is the fact that this signature is at very large scales, so we just have a finite number of modes, so we have finite accuracy, and unfortunately, the, the, this is also the other probe that we can immediately think of, which is polarization, is affected by exactly the same thing. So the question is, well, how can we actually go further from you know, the point of view of confronting to, to the well? And so I want you to comment on one specific thing. The only way I can think of to try to go out of this conundrum is to think of coupling between large scales and small scales, which of course is well, essentially bispectrum. Uh, and so I'd like you to tell us a little bit the prospect, in particular the squeeze configuration, of course. And so can you say a few more about uh, prospect? Are there calculations there? Yeah. And uh, yeah. are you having anything more interesting than the Melde Sina bound? Uh, you know, just a few words. On it. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree with everything you said, namely that looking at this bispectrum, the three point correlation of functions is uh, non Gaussian. It is a, I mean, you mentioned that before, and other people have mentioned, and I, I completely agree with that. So there is, I mentioned, there is preliminary work by Ivan Aguillo, but uh, it is not exactly in this kind of framework. It is slightly different framework in within loop quantum gravity, and it was also not completely finished, what he had done up here. And so, I, I, I mean, I, last night I looked up the paper after our discussion, and it is not as conclusive as I had gathered from the, uh, seminars, because in the seminars he, pre he presented a work which was in progress, which is not yet written up. So unfortunately, I cannot give any you know, definitive answers. I just want to say that that is a priority for us to calculate this, and, uh, and I, I agree that that would be a good, good signature. But I mean, I, I, I know a priori reason to believe that uh, one would be able to say that there is going to be you know, large, I mean, within still the Planck bonds, within, less than five, but there will be some signature which is, uh, which is going to be there. I, I do not know. But this, this is a question that is, uh, that, that is really something that we would like to understand. But like another thing that, we, so this is much more important, but another small thing that we are also looking at is the hemispherical anisotropy. And that is something also that Ivan uh, Aguirre had done. And again, the point is not that any one of them is significant, but if three of them are, you know, so, so that, that's, that, that's another direction in which we're looking at. But anything anybody wants to tell me about what we should be calculating about the bispectrum and, and so on, that would be very helpful. I mean, I, you already, we already mentioned, but maybe you have other things to mention, right? I, I agree completely with you. Okay, thank you. So uh, the, this is the end of the seminar, and we should, we should see our speaker again.